Welcome everybody to this moderately quick look at business applications that use quadratic functions. As I've stated in other videos, quadratics are extremely versatile and used all over the place, uh, business being one of them. And, uh, you know, since we're always wanting to know when we break even with things, right, you know, when cost and revenue are equal, uh, we can use quadratics uh, that way. We want to be able to maximize revenue or profits, right? So being able to find the max of a quadratic is helpful. You can graph quadratic supply and demand functions, and then you can find equilibrium, market equilibrium points, um, you know, by basically finding where they intersect. So those are going to be some of the things we're going to be doing with these. So first, let's look at uh, break-even points and maximizations. So we know that uh, functions for costs, revenue, and then we also know that um, if we want to find a break-even point, we need to figure out when that cost function equals that revenue function. Well, in a monopoly market, the revenue of a company is restricted by the demand for that product. In this case, the relationship between the price um, of said profit and then, of course, the number of things sold is described by the demand function, uh, which we just call P. I, I guess we call it P instead of D because it's um, the demand is influenced by price, so it's kind of almost like a price function, right? And then the total revenue function for the product is given by P times X. It's basically the, the price function, right, times how many units sold, the X, and that gives you revenue. Should make sense, right, that, you know, the amount of money you make is the price you charge times the number of things you, you get rid of. Now, in a in a basic sense, right, in a, in, a, in a basic scenario, your revenue function is just a constant times X, right? Because you're just going to charge the same $20 for every T-shirt you sell, so to speak. But in the monopoly market, right, where um, the demand for the product is restricted, and so therefore kind of the more things you produce, the less they're going to sell, you know, so the or so you have to lower the price to get people to buy it. You know, so there's this really stronger relationship between price and how many things are sold. Then of course, price itself becomes a function of units sold. So that's why it all of a sudden becomes this function in terms of X because it's a function in terms of units sold. So suppose we have this cost function, and this is cost per week of producing a high tech product. So that's why you've got such a large um, constant cost, right, versus variable cost. Because no if you produce nothing, right, if your X's are at zero, you're still paying 3600 probably for, you know, uh, rental space of your lab or, you know, big factory or something. And then suppose further that we have a weekly demand function for this product of the demand equals 500 minus 2X. So you can kind of think of this as, the price starts at 500 and as you produce more things, you have to lower the price because you're kind of flooding the market with this item, right? So there's more of them, so there's less demand, so the price is going down. It's that kind of thing. Well, then it's very easy to figure out a revenue function because it's just P times X, so we just take that price function, we hit, hit it with an X, which gives us 500X minus 2X squared, and then, of course, we know that Profits is revenue minus cost, so all we have to do is, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're trying to find the, um, the break-even point, so we're going to set them equal to each other. And because we notice that we have these squared terms, we're going, okay, we're dealing with quadratics, right? we're dealing with parabolas, and the only way to solve a quadratic is to put everything on one side and set it equal to zero. So we shuffle everything over to this side, set it equal to zero. The first thing you always want to do is see if we can reduce it, i.e., can we factor out something? And in this case, we can factor out the constant 4, which makes it a much simpler quadratic. In fact, it's so simple now that we can use the simple AC method, where we look for factors of 900 that will add to negative 100. And the reason why we know they will add to is because since this is a positive, that means both of our constants have to be the same sign, right? Because either a positive times a positive will give us a positive, or a negative times a negative will give us a positive. So anytime there's a plus in front of your constant, you know that the two numbers inside your factors 
have to have the same sign. They both have to be positive or they both have to be negative. And then, of course, the sign in front of the middle term tells you what that sign is, right? So they both have to be the same thing. And if this is a, a plus, then they'd both be positive. And if this is a negative, they'd both be negative. Regardless of that, if they're both the same sign, then you know you're adding them together, right, to get that middle number. If they were opposite signs, you were looking for the differences between them. So in this case, we know they're the same, so we're adding them together. We're trying to get 100, so it's basically factors of 900 that get us 100. We go, oh, 90 and 10, and because it has to be negative, we slap little minus signs in front of them, and these are our two factors. Anytime we have two things multiplying that equals zero, the zero factor property tells us that each of them can be zero, so you take x minus 90, set it equal to zero, which means you add 90 to the other side and get x equals 90. Same thing here, x equals 10 makes this a zero. So we have two equilibrium points at uh, 10 and 90. Does this mean the firm will break even at 10 units and at 90 units? Yes, absolutely, right? Um, and if we graph the two functions, you can, you can see that, that those are the two intersection points between the two things. Now, the cost function is this lower function. The revenue function is this parabola function. We can see that if we found the vertex of the parabola, we'd be up here, and this would be max revenue. But because the cost function is growing so quickly, if we actually maximized our quote-unquote revenue, our costs would be higher, and we'd actually be at a loss, right? Anytime, so a, a function, if a function is taller than another function, then to figure out what's going on, it's the taller one minus the bottom one, and the difference is their heights. So anytime the cost function is below the revenue function, that's where you're going to make profit. Because if you, you know, if you pick, okay, I'm going to produce 60 things. I come up straight up from 60, and that tells me my cost is 1,600. But if I go straight up from 60, I see that my revenue is about 2,200, right? So 2,200 minus 1,600, yay, I made, or 22,000, sorry, minus 16,000, I made $6,000. So that's, that's why visually this is a profit. So obviously this whole range is a profit range. And you would want to figure out where your greatest profit is, and that would really be where your, um, your largest vertical distance between the two and it looks like it's happening kind of right here in the middle so from the graph we can observe that the firm it makes a profit after they produce 10 units all the way up until they produce 90 units because that's like i said from the picture when the revenue function is greater than the cost function i.e it's graphed above it if they produce exactly 90 that's where they cross so that's a profit of zero that's a break even right and then, as we saw, if they produce more than that, the cost function gets higher than the, the revenue function, and thus they start losing money. So they definitely don't want to produce more than 90. In fact, they don't even want to produce 90 because they break even. They want to produce somewhere between 10 and 90. Okay, so back to our total cost and our total revenue function. If we want to find the, the number of units that maximizes profit, well, then all we have to do is set up the profit function and then maximize it. Well, profit is revenue minus cost. So instead of setting these two things equal to each other like we did before to find the equilibrium price, we're going to take the difference, revenue minus cost, which will give us profit. And once again, it's a quadratic. So we want to solve it as a quadratic. Now, you can always do it two different ways, right? So this is a quadratic as it sits, but... The rule of thumb is whenever you have a quadratic, it's always better to make the leading coefficient, that's a fancy term for the uh, number in front of the squared term, right? So the number in front of the x squared. You always want to make that positive. So instead of leaving it like this, think about moving everything to the other side of the equal sign and having 4x squared, right? Because you've got to add to bring it over and then minus 400x, sorry, 400x, and then plus 3600 equals zero. This is much easier to deal with than a negative leading coefficient. But if we do this, we now have that a equals four, 
B equals negative 400, and C equals 3,600. Once you know A, B, and C, you can figure out everything you need for a, a quadratic member because to find the vertex, it's simply minus B over 2A. So there's my minus B over 2 times A. See, now in this case, they left it the other way. For us, right, we would have had A equals 4 and B equals negative 400. And so we would have had a negative B, which made it a positive 400, all over 2 times A, and we get 400 over 8, which of course reduces to 50. They get negative 400 over negative 8, which also reduces to 50, right? It's always going to be the same either way. It just depends on if you want to have A being positive or negative. I say it's a good habit to make it positive because if you ever want to try and factor these things, it's much easier to factor with a leading coefficient that's positive. But in any case, we know that the vertex of this function is when x equals 50, and we know that that, therefore, is going to be the maximum, right? And so all we have to do is plug it back into the function, and figure out what that maximum is and get $6,400. Now, you might be thinking, well, if A is positive, then we know that the parabola opens up and then this becomes a minimum. Yes, that is true. But remember, the original function that we got from doing profit minus cost gave us a negative in front of X squared, which means this function originally, if we graphed it, opens down, so the vertex is a maximum. By multiplying everything through by negative 1, which is basically what you do to put it on the other side, if you multiply a function by a negative constant, it always flips it vertically. So this function becomes look, you know, start, looks like this. So that's why it, it, it might seem like those things don't match, that it's not a maximum. It's just because we did an algebraic manipulation to it to make the work easier if we were going to try and factor it. But in any case, the original one looked like this. So here's our vertex. Here's our max. If we produce 50 things, we're going to maximize our profit at 6,400, which, remember, was pretty darn close to what I said when I got 6,000. So you can kind of tell where it should be just by looking at the uh, graph. Okay, the last thing to look at, supply, demand, market equilibrium, right? You should know what all these things mean. Um, let's say the, the, the first court quadrant part of this thing may represent a supply curve, whereas the first quadrant part of this thing may represent a demand curve. So when we say first quadrant, it just means the portion of the function that's in the first quadrant of our um, Cartesian plane. And the first quadrant is always here, and then it goes counterclockwise. So this is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. And the reason why we're, we normally um, restrict these functions to the first quadrant is it's the only place where both the x values and the y values are positive. And when we're dealing with functions that are supposed to model things in the real world, you usually can't have negative things in the real world. Well, you can obviously have negative profits, right, because you can lose money. But in the case of, of these functions, the x-axis is always set up, well, it's not always, but it's almost always set up as the number of things sold or the number of things produced, right? And you can't sell or produce negative things, right? I mean, you, you can't definitely can't produce negative things, and you can't sell negative things. You might think, well, what if I produce things and I don't sell them? Isn't that a negative sale? No, it's not. You just didn't sell anything. Your sales are at zero, right? So that's why we restrict them to these quadrants. Finding market equilibrium um, can seem like a, a weird process. Uh, for someone who doesn't understand economics thoroughly, and myself being one of those people, I always thought, well, market equilibrium is when supply equals demand, right? And, and everybody goes, yeah, that's when supply equals demand. I'm like, okay, so if you give me two functions for supply and demand, if they have to equal each other, I should just be able to set them equal to each other. Well, the problem is, is that you'll oftentimes come across these types of situations where your demand function has both price and, I guess, quantity in it, Q for quantity. And then the supply um, function also is basically defined in terms of price and quantity sold. 
if you set these two things equal to each other, you're going to have those two variables, uh, both P and Q. And when you set them equal to each other, you basically get one equation. And now this is where the mathematician takes over and goes, well, I know that I cannot solve one equation in two unknowns. So I've got two variables. The only way to solve um, with two variables is to have two equations. So you're basically solving what's called a system of simultaneous equations. You have to solve these two equations simultaneously at the same time. I.e., you have to find a value for P that is the same in both of them, or a value for Q that is the same in both of them. And there are various different techniques for solving systems of equations. When you have things like this, where your two variables are multiplied together, and they're not just separated by pluses and minuses, it gets a little trickier. If you have them just separated by pluses and minuses, it's very easy. You can use an elimination method, an addition method, you know, very simple stuff. But when you have this, this becomes a big pain in the tuchus. So what you have to do is you basically have to do the substitution method. And the substitution method says, take one of your equations, solve it in terms of one of your two variables, then take that answer and plug it into the other equation. So we took this one because it's the easiest one to solve for a variable. I personally would have solved for Q, but the book decided to solve for P by adding Q and 38 to the other side and then dividing by 2 and getting this lovely little thing for P. The reason why I would have solved for uh, Q is it wouldn't have introduced fractions, and I don't like to deal with fractions, but that's just me. So now that we have this as a representative P, we can plug it into the other equation, right? So this P becomes all of this junk, and then we take that and um, foil it through, right? Multiply it through to see what we get. And now we notice that we have a Q squared and a Q, right? So it's now in terms of one variable, so we can solve it, but that equation is now quadratic, so we know we gotta bring the 400 over, which gives us negative 324. And now it's set equal to zero, which is what we need in order to solve a quadratic. I would get rid of that half by multiplying through by a two, which I wouldn't have had in the first place if we'd gone in the other direction, but say lovey. So now we have Q squared 48, you know, minus 648 equals zero, nice and easy, round, perfect numbers. A leading coefficient of one makes it really easy to factor. Find factors of 648 that have a difference of 42. We know it's a difference because there's a minus sign here. Uh, so we find 12 and 54, which tells us Q equals 12 and Q equals negative 54. Remember, Q is quantity of things sold, so that means we're either selling 12 units or we're selling negative 54 units, which, of course, is impossible, right? Oftentimes with quadratics, you're going to get a, a, a possible answer and an impossible answer. And what happens is the impossible answer is just what occurs on your uh, function in one of these other quadrants, which don't make sense in the real world. So we throw that away and we use 12 instead. Now we take 12 as the quantity, go throw it back into our other function, right, that we had already solved for P so that we can know what the price is. So we get 1 half times 12, right, plus 19, and we get a, a price of 25. So therefore, we know that the equilibrium price is going to happen when we sell 12 units at a price of 25, and then we can figure out what that would be, you know, that would be um, $300. That's going to be kind of our equilibrium point revenue, so to speak. But in any case, if we graph the two functions, you can see that it is, in fact, where they cross each other. So it does correlate to this idea of when do these two functions equal each other. We, we were still finding the point of intersection. We were still finding where they equal each other. But because the functions are in terms of two different variables and not just one, right? They both weren't written in terms of X. They were written in terms of P's and Q's. Then we can't set them equal to each other and solve because then we would get one equation with two unknowns, which is impossible to solve algebraically. So instead, we have to solve them as a system of equations. We have to solve those two equations simultaneously, which means we have to use either the addition method, the elimination method, or the substitution method. And because of the way these things were written out, really the only one that works is the substitution method, which thus led us to this final answer. And that is everything you guys need to know about business applications using quadratics.